Bueno, hola a todos. Eh, bienvenidos a esta entrevista que vamos a realizar desde CIRCOM eh, con Paul Coxot. Eh, yo soy Guillén Murcia y nada, os quería presentar a Paul, que es eh, profesor jubilado de la Universidad de Glasgow, eh, ingeniero informático, economista y autor de varios libros, entre ellos eh, el Cibercomunismo con Maxi Nieto, que conoceréis. También es autor de How the World Works, un libro que tiene el subtítulo de una historia del trabajo global y de eh, Towards a New Socialism con eh, Alin Cottrell, compañero suyo, eh, economista también, en la Universidad de Wake Forest, si no, me, si no me equivoco, y de Arguments for Socialism con David Zakaria, Argumentos para el Socialismo. Eh, Paul es uno de los autores que más influencia han tenido en el proyecto de Zipcom y como supongo que ya conoceréis, bueno, pues tenemos varios artículos eh, que ha escrito, hemos traducido y colgado en la web y que podéis consultar. Eh, pondremos el enlace a la web en la descripción de este vídeo, a nuestras redes sociales, el, también a las redes sociales al canal de YouTube de, de Jesús Rojo, que es el compañero que nos había sugerido el, realizar esta entrevista. Y también pondremos el enlace al blog de Paul y a su canal de YouTube, donde sube contenido de forma regular sobre numerosos temas, pero en particular, y uno de los temas que, lógicamente, por el que más nos interesa y en el que más se ha centrado su trabajo, es el de la planificación económica. La entrevista, bueno, la voy a realizar en inglés, eh, contaréis con subtítulos, y nada, pues voy a, a comenzar las preguntas con Paul. Uh, okay, so Paul, uh, we're very glad to have you here. You're very welcome. You, uh, as I was mentioning in your introduction, uh, I was saying that you're a big influence on our project on Sitcom. Uh, I'd like to start by asking you what, what's your intellectual biography or What are the works or authors that have influenced you the most? And, you know, how did Paul Cockshot come to be who he is uh, politically or intellectually and what he does? Okay, uh, I originally started wanting to be a scientist and an inventor. Um, and when I went to university, I was studying science, but I became involved in Marxist politics through contact with people in what um, was called the Canadian Party of Labour because I was in Canada then. Um, it's, uh, it was a sister party of progressive Labour, which was basically a sort of Maoist uh, influence party. And we did quite a lot of basic reading of Marxism there in my first year at university. And that influenced me to drop science and decide I want to become an economist uh, because I thought uh, Marxism made me interested in economics. Um, so although I, with retrospect, I did much better in science than I did in economics, I uh, went off and did a, an economics degree um, Now, what influenced me intellectually then was that the first year of my economics degree as an undergraduate, when I, I would have been 18 then, I, I read Capital. Um, so really that's probably had a, a bit, that was the thing which had the biggest influence on me. I also read um, Althusser, um, Who else was influential at the time? Red Alters, I read Weber, um, Schumpeter, Kaleski, uh, Keynes. I mean, prom people who I thought were prominent um, thinkers, Freud, you know. Um, so, and I also started reading some, I think which had an influence, reading some classical history reading some Tacitus and uh, 
other things like that that had an influence um what i i then later after i looked for work i started working as a school teacher i got fired for my union activities um so i got a job as a trainee programmer with the post office or they advertise for trainee programmers um but in fact i was just end up doing office work calculating how many telephone lines were needed between london and paris for a given level of traffic and i was struck by how poor the level of understanding of the staff managing me there were they 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 were um they were talking about traffic in terms of airlines and none of them could tell me what an airline unit was um it really taught me what bureaucracy was because the in the buildings there were shelves of manuals called TIs which stood for telecommunications instructions which told you exactly what to do in all circumstances and you if if you want to know what to do you were supposed to get the right TI and get it and read it and do it but it it taught me how you could have a a bureaucracy doing things without the people understanding the rules by which it was done um they just had to follow the rules and this was even more made evident to me when we were t- trying to assess what kind of telephone exchange equipment to buy and i was asked to find out what was the best queuing system to use for the for the calls and the astonishing thing was that all the, i i went off to a li- to the post office library and discovered all the basic research on this had been done by people in the british post office in the 1940s and the organization didn't know the result of that and, and was having to get me a, a a new new graduate to try and find out so i left the, the there and actually got a proper training in computing and went to work for one of the main hardware companies in britain which was international computers limited um and worked on on the design of various mainframe machines peripherally and then got myself a phd in computing and from then on was employed either in industry or in uh, academia in the computing area and the economics was something that was a, a background interest not done in my working time but in my free time but on the other hand the training that i got in um computer science gave me a different approach to the problems that i became aware of of socialist planning because um but by the 1980s i was in the communist party and the it was evident to me that the there was no adequate refutation being brought to to the pro market ideas that were circulating in in the soviet union under gorbachev and it it seemed to me that the claims that you couldn't rationally plan the cal- the economy couldn't be sustainable from what i knew about computing so i tried to 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 think through what what would be the actual mechanism by which computer technology could be applied to solve those problems so that the the book towards a new socialism was influenced by that that background and also from obviously the fact that I, I was intimately familiar with capital I'd read it several times by then and also something that's miss I've missed out actually is that the in the uh, let's see from from most of the 70s I was in a, co- a left wing collective with Alan Cottrell and others that did a lot of concrete economic analysis of the the conjuncture in Britain like we we pioneered collecting marxist economic statistics of the british economy and the 
the long-term trends of the rate of surplus value, the long-term trends of the rate of profit and things. So that that trained us as a group in the practical use of economic statistics, which in general, um, most Marxists took little interest in those days, in, in those days, or if they did, they just reproduced bourgeois sources. They didn't reanalyze the, the national income in Marxist categories. So there were these, these political backgrounds and those, those intellectual backgrounds. Right. Um, so delving a bit into the subject, what is in a very broad sense, if you will, or you can get into, into detail if you want, your diagnosis on the current uh, global situation and how do you expect the socioeconomic and envir environmental outlook uh, to, to change, if, if you will, after the current COVID uh, pandemic? Do you think it's, uh, I don't know, how, how, what's your view about the, the possible effects that uh, the whole pandemic is going to have on both uh, the political and the economic fronts? Well, it, it's obviously, heightened social antagonism. You've only got to look at what's happened in the United States to see that. Um, it has also undermined the, the claims that the state has to follow very tight budgetary policies. States have had to intervene at a level which they haven't done in the neoliberal period. Um, so that, that will have an ideological effect how much of an effect is it impossible to say up until now? Um, and also there are obviously unknowns. We don't know how effective the, the vaccination process will be, how long will the crisis go on, uh, whether it'll recover from it quickly, um, depends on whether that vaccination is effective or not. And we don't know that at the moment. So it's difficult to say. There's obviously also the factor that um, China has come out of this well compared to the capitalist West, and therefore it's producing a, um, a turning point in terms of the balance of forces in the world. Uh, and the, the capitalist countries are in relative, sorry, the Western capitalist countries, since we'll leave open the nature of China, um, are in relative decline and I think it would be unsafe to think there will, there's no danger of war. Right. The, the, the antagonism between the United States and China is so evident. Um, there are clear attempts by the US to bring um, Britain and Japan into a naval alliance against China. Um, there's attempts to bring India into an alliance against China. So we're seeing a, a, um, a military polarization, which is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you seen any, um, you were speaking about the heightened social antagonisms and the example of the United States. And this question wasn't in the list, but now that you mentioned it, have you seen anything like that? Or what's your view about Britain, about after the whole Brexit uh, thing happened? Um, do you see any increase in social antagonism or, or what's... what's Not at the moment. I think the, the in this country, the... COVID situation has not produced a sharp sharpening so far, largely because at the start, at least, the state was willing to fund um, you know, fund people who, are, who were not working. However, the, as time has gone on, the degree of that funding has proven more and more inadequate. But it's that works through mainly into pressure to ease the lockdown things quickly. It doesn't 
yet come through into open um, class antagonism or civil disorder. Okay, so in, you know, when considering all of those issues and not only, well, I mean, in the face of these problems, but not only uh, regarding that, but in general, why do you see economic planning as an answer, not only to these problems, but to the, the, the problems that are inherent to capitalism? I mean, you mentioned how you were drawn or became interested in it, but could you summarize why will economic planning be an answer to the problems in capitalism, both those that are structural to it and the problems that we are being witnesses to today, like what you mentioned? Okay, um, well, there's, there's, the, the, there's two sorts of um, answers to that. One of them is answers to do with the environmental crisis, which imposes or is in the process of imposing physical constraints on the economy, things which uh, physical limits that the economy must meet. Now, either those are going to be imposed in some way or we're heading for a disaster. Now, let's assume that some form of imposition of them is going to take place. And that's going to require effectively a type of planning. The issue which it comes down to is whether you have the, the direct planning in terms of the state actually setting targets and taking control of industries and making sure that they're done or whether you continue on to the neoliberal model of using financial incentives. And it's dubious that the financial incentive approach is going to work, to my mind. The, the, the st direct state intervention uh, is the only thing that we know has worked in these kinds of circumstances because the closest analogy to it is the is either the war economies when the structure of output had to be radically changed or periods like um, Soviet or Chinese industrialization, both of which relied ha heavily on planning. So the a priori background assumption is that planning will be necessary because that's what's the only way it's happened in the past that worked. Um, beyond that, if, if we suppose that, that there was no environmental problem, we know there is one, but pr just pretend there wasn't one, what would the situation be? Well, then you have to go and look at what the nature of the crisis that, that the Western capitalist world had got into in the, at the end of the third quarter of the 20th century, from the 1970s to the 1980s. Because over that period, the Western world went through a major economic crisis of, of stagnation, inflation, etc. And that was a crisis brought about by a combination of two things. On the one hand, the state had been following a policy of relatively full employment. And this, the circumstances were such that there was re relatively rapid capital accumulation. The combination of those two put a severe pressure, both on the rate of profit and the rate of surplus value. Now, the neoliberal response to that was to try and increase the rate of surplus value by forcing down wages, forcing down the wage share, and to slow the rising rate of profit by reducing the level of accumulation. But the net effect of that was to produce a phase change in development. 
that if you look at the capitalist world up until the 1980s, there's relatively rapid development. After that, you've got very slow rate of development of labor productivity, almost coming to a stop. So the, these are the internal limits of the capitalist mode of production, that once it has used up the reserve armies of labor, once the rural populations of Europe had moved to the cities, the possibility of rapid growth of the old form came to an end and they could only work by, to maintain a, a pool of labor by running the economy at low level of intensity, by chronic mass unemployment as has occurred throughout Europe. Now, there was another route out of that. There was a route out of the 1970s, 80s uh, crisis, which was one of moving the Western economies towards a more planned level of development in which investment occurred at state direction rather than investment occurred as a result of private decisions. Now, if you're relying on private decisions to make the investment, the circumstances in these economies were such that low rates of profit, stagnant demand, um, you just didn't get the, 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 the mass of private investment that uh, you were able to get in the, the period before that. And the only option would have been to shift from a profit-oriented system of investment to a, a planned system of investment where the investments either made, fun, funded out of taxation and directed towards social uses. Otherwise, you're in the situation of prolonged, slow development of technology, declining real wages, uh, huge reserve armies of labor, and increasing class polarization. Right. So in light of that, how important do you feel are new technologies on the issue or the development of new technologies? Because I remember I watched an interview, um, uh, one of your interviews, when you were talking about, I think it was towards a new socialism, your book. And the interview was like, I don't know, in the late 90s or maybe early 2000s or whatever. Uh, in any case, it was way after the book had been published. And you mentioned that technology had already experienced a huge uh, jump you know it had progressed uh, very fast and it made even your like uh, even even more possible what oh, you yeah. had been advocated for advocating for in your book so how do you view how how do you review your at, your at the time you wrote the book uh, the assumption was you need a major supercomputer center to do the planning mm -hmm. now you could just use uh, a bunch of powerful surface and they're going to be enough. The machines of the, 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 the power that you require are being, uh, I mean, they're being sold off secondhand for a few hundred euros now because they are so plentiful. Uh, it's, the, the technology just isn't a, a, just isn't a problem. Um, you can get a secondhand machine with 60, 128 gigabytes of memory and 16 processors that, that would do the job for under a thousand euros. Uh, so it's, it, the, the technology has made it uh, ridiculously attainable. Um, the main difficulty is not the actual technology, it's setting up the software infrastructure, um, which, which will take much longer. You can just buy the machines off the shelf now, but uh, setting up the the planning technology infrastructure would be a uh, five to ten year job. Mm -hmm. How do you view um, democracy? Because you talk about you talk about the topic quite a lot, and you, in fact, in in towards the new socialism, also, also you you mentioned the topic. How do you? How do you think economic planning and democracy mesh and what will it look like 
democratic institutions and in, in the economy in a, in a society that planned the economy the key decisions that have to be taken democratically are ones to do with essentially the the public goods and general direction of investment people have to have a say over what share of national income is going to go to investment what share of national income is going to go to health education etc meeting has been upgraded by the host okay um the <laughs> people need us to, to be able to vote on these issues and that can be done nowadays by electronic voting techniques it's not it, it's it's quite feasible for people to express their views on these things and that be acted on one of the big contradictions of of 20th century socialism was essentially that um, an arist a political aristocracy of the working class made the decisions on how much should be invested, uh, where the money should be spent, the resources should be spent, and there was no general public participation and discussion in this. And therefore, it was easy for our opponents of socialism to say, you People are just being exploited by the state. It's a state dictatorship uh, that they have no real say in it. But it's perfectly feasible to have such decisions made by the population. And a key point in our argument has been that what the communists needed to, to do was create forms of democracy that were much more democratic than the Western countries had, and ones which, because they were so democratic, would make it very difficult for a property elite to dominate them. And basically, we're saying you have to get rid of elections altogether. You have to get a, have a system where any representative body is statistically representative. It's drawn from the general working class or the general class mix of the population. Mm -hmm. so that it's dominated, will be dominated by those lower in the social strata because there's more of them. Any system of election always works to the benefit of the educated and property classes. And that is really sort of one of the key points we're making. And that, when I was saying, well, where are the influences? Really, it's the study of the classics that's the influence mm -hmm. there. It's, it's, it's Aristotle's political theory uh, and the writings by classical scholars in the Marxist tradition who had to who were working in the 1950s and 60s fleeing McCarthyism that brought that home to me right um I just thought that what you were mentioning about democracy and about about um, people being involved in the in the key decisions and linking that with the previous question on new technologies, do you feel that, for example, smartphones are a way to make political decisions more approachable in the sense that you could, you know, you could get an input from the people on yeah. that sort of decisions, like. I mean, everyone has phones now. You don't actually, you wouldn't actually need to use a smartphone. I mean, the system we developed at Glasgow University was designed to work just with feature phones because yeah. we wanted something that could work in India, for example, where most people only had feature phones. But right. with the passage of time, uh, we can expect some kind of smartphones to be more generally used. There's a slight issue of trust associated with smartphones in that it's harder to be sure that um, if you're voting using a smartphone app that there is not a back channel which is covertly revealing your private vote right. um, because the more intelligence you put into a, a, a device the harder it is to know whether it's a, um, 
whether the voter can trust it mm -hmm. entirely. Um, and we know that the trustworthiness of elect electronic voting systems is a major issue. Um, mm. the, 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 there is a lot of, you've only got to look at the controversy in the United States repeatedly over the electronic voting systems there. Yeah. And, and my worry about smartphones is that, how do you know that, you know, to put it crudely, that Google hasn't hacked the uh, app you're using? Mm. To distort the result. Yeah. Okay, so moving on the next question. Uh, this might get a bit <laughs> uh, controversial. Do you think there is enough historical evidence to show the superiority of economic planning over markets? And what does, for example, the Soviet Union represent for or your ideas or for proof or evidence to, to support the superiority of, of planning, given that it is sometimes argued by, by, uh, by capitalist uh, uh, proponents that the collapse of the Soviet Union precisely shows that economic planning, can, planning cannot work and that you need to rely on markets and so on. Well, on the contrary, it shows exactly the opposite um, because you have a controlled experiment there. You have Russia mm -hmm. under the plan system from 1928 till 1988, say, okay? 60 year period, mm -hmm. uh, during which it grows rapidly. The liberal, neoliberals promise that if you undergo shock therapy, privatize everything and allow the market to go, the economy will improve. Well. Um, no, I was in Russia a couple of years ago um, giving a talk and there were other people talking there and they were saying that Russian industrial output has still not regained the level of the Brezhnev years. So yeah. we have, they had by that stage had maybe 30 years of, um, of liberal economic policy and you'd, you'd actually gone backwards. So it's, it's, it's quite clear that you've got all that changed is the economic policy. The national culture was the same, still the Russian mm -hmm. people, still you, you actually had the same level of education, all of the same was there but the result was exactly the opposite of what the, the pro-market people said. Yeah. Uh, do you think there are any other experiences, especially current uh, experiences that can offer anything like, and it's different systems or different examples, of course, but just to know what you think about them. China, Cuba, I think you were in Vietnam, several years ago what do you what do you feel well, i mean it, it it's clear that both china and vietnam have developed at an extraordinary rate um but they're only partly a planned economy they're, they're macroeconomic planning and some industrial level planning um what they struck me as in a way vaguely familiar because they reminded me of the sort of economy that Britain had in the 1960s under Harold Wilson, except where the government had a lot more power than, than the, 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 the social democrat governments had in Europe. But they certainly have a lot more planning than the Western capitalist countries have, and they've done a lot better. That's not a fair comparison though, because these are countries at an earlier stage of economic development and it's easier to grow fast when you're at an earlier stage. The relevant comparison is with take China and Vietnam on the one hand and India and Indonesia or India and Bangladesh on the other hand to see countries that started out in the same sort of position and haven't had the degree of state dominance of the economy and you can see 
that the improvement in living standards in China and Vietnam has been far greater than in India and Bangladesh. Right. Okay, now I want to ask you about um, other proposals or other, um, yeah, proposals to, to overcome or to replace uh, uh, capitalism. I uh, wanted to know about your views on uh, things such as market socialism, which I guess you don't have a very, <laughs> you're not very fond of, uh, the basic income proposal, um, Paracon, by I think it's uh, Robin Hannell, and the planning proposal of uh, Daniel E. Saros. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing I don't know the last one. Right. I've never heard of the last one, I'm afraid. Um, on the market socialism, well, compared to what we have at the moment, it would be a big improvement. Um, the, the question was that we were addressing in our book in, in, in 1990 was, would it be a big improvement for the Soviet Union? And our view was, no, it was a big risk that it, it, it was a, a cover politically for actually reintroducing a full market capitalist economy and that it was just the people who said they wanted market socialism really wanted capitalism and they were just using that as a cover story and i think we were right on that if you were moving to it from from the the west i think there is no way of avoiding having a period during which you have a mixed economy um, in, in which market relations still exist whilst planning relations are developing so I see it as an unstable situation which polarizes one way or the other. It's not an, uh, it's not an end result stable situation. On the um, basic income pro proposal, um, this seems to me a really far right uh, ideology. It is something proposed by Friedman and the Hayekians as a way of getting rid of the welfare state. Um, just play a, fa a flat, some to people independent of need to get rid of the, princi the principle of distribution according to need that, that you have in the welfare state. And the, if you actually do costings of it, because the Green Party was proposing it in Scotland, and I did a costing of what their proposals would be, it would, it would pose an an unacceptable, uh, sorry, a politically unacceptable level of taxation on the masses of the working class. Because we know that under the existing tax system, the increases in taxes largely fall on those, on people who are wage earners. There are so many exemptions and, the, and um, loopholes that the property would have to avoid taxation, that introducing a basic income scheme in a capitalist economy means taxing the mass of the working class to pay benefits which would subsidize low wage employers. It would lower the, 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 the gap between, sorry, it would enable employers to pay even lower wages and people would still be able to survive and the rest of uh, the workers would be taxed to do that to subsidize the lowest paid lowest paying employers mm -hmm. right and um what do you think about paragon by robin hannell or you don't you're not are you not familiar i, with I, I have been familiar with it and i wrote a response to it but it was many years ago and I'm afraid I, I don't remember enough details to give a, a plausible answer now. No, no worries. Okay, moving on. Um, looking back, what do you think has been the evolution, especially yourself, because you have a very, uh, you've been advocating for these ideas for, for a long time. How do you feel has the evolution on these ideas been in, 
especially in recent years? Do you feel there's there's an increase in interest or a revival of these debates, or do you feel we're like going back in circles where you see people making the same points that you tried to refute decades ago? Well, no, I mean, I think that there has been a, a continuous from the late 90s onwards or from 2000 onwards, there's been a, a continuous growth of interest in the things we're saying. Um, now, it's the nature of, of exponential growth that things seem to start slow and then get faster. But certainly in terms of the number of people paying attention to it, it is it's growing at what seems like a slow exponential rate. OK, a, a slow percentage per year. But when you add up, it's exponentially greater. And also circumstances are conspiring to to mean that in one way or another. People are having to face these issues and other people start saying similar sorts of things. Um, so I think the, the interest in economic planning is much greater. Um, the number, if I'm judging just by the number of people who write to me and ask questions, uh, as I say, that's growing exponentially. It's, it's, it, I get so many people coming and asking me questions that it's, it's difficult to keep up with what people are saying. And I'm curious, do you, do you get all these questions from, I mean, from uh, all around the world or is there any particular um, area where, where people seem to be more interested like Europe or maybe Asia or? or okay, the they, come from, they come from three areas. Um, Europe, the United States and Brazil are the main places. Um, probably the slight, yeah, it's, uh, it's in that order, or it might be United States, Europe, and Brazil, but Brazil is certainly a large part of it. That's interesting. Okay. So we also wanted to ask you, um, what will you think will be the, the best way to disseminate and develop the, the planning project? How do you think um, communists who want to put forward or to want to, to advance or to move forward towards the, the model of, an, uh, of a plan, economically planned society, how should they act? What sort of political proposals, political debates, um, struggles, should they focus on, or how you if, think it if will you're increase in, the... If you're in a collective, um, mm -hmm. in a given country, and you're all in one country, I would say uh, you, you should be working at analyzing the economic situation in that country and put, putting forward economic, outline economic plans to the, to the working class movement for that country, ones that, where you you actually do the economic calculations that it's feasible, that it's within the level of national income that you can achieve, and you put forward you try and advance that within the trade union or labour movement. Mm -hmm. And the only experience I have of doing that was um, plans for the energy industry for the the workers in the energy industry in the nineteen seventies. Right. But if, if you can, if you can possibly get the contacts with the, the trade unions in your country on that, that's, that's the thing to do. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the working on the economic or, or researching the economic situation of your country, but also in some of your writings, you mentioned the need for a European socialist party or something well, of sort. It's clear that there are only two thing, two courses of development in Europe at the moment. Either the European Federation breaks up uh, and other countries leave it, like Britain did, 
It's quite possible might maybe Italy or Greece might. Or else you're going to get a centralization of power. And um, if you had a centralization of power and it went along with an electoral system whereby the European Parliament could actually set taxes and set policies, then it would be viable to have a European Socialist Party because it would be standing for a parliament that would actually have power to, for instance, bring in a European-wide pension, bring in a European-wide health system. Yeah. Um, for, for you to get international political parties, you either need them to be ones that are going to be campaigning for a parliament where they've got a hope of achieving something, and you can't achieve anything with the existing European Parliament because it has so little uh, revenue raising and spending powers. Or they've got to be uh, uh, movements like the, 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 the first, second and third internationals where their alliances with the aim of overthrowing the existing system in these different countries. Now, if you were going to have a European um, Socialist Party, given the existing constitutional structure, the fact that the European Parliament can't actually decide on anything substantive, those, uh, it would have to be a movement that was for radically changing the whole constitutional structure of Europe. Well, to, 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 to create it, make something more dem democratic. Otherwise, you, they, there will just be a plaything of the existing establishment and, don't, and be incapable of mobilizing people on any real basis. Right. Okay, we're going to finish with a few questions that might be very specific, but some of the I don't think comrades wanted to to ask to you. Um, right. So I got this question which says on some occasions you have stressed how instructive the experience of the Glasgow water plebiscite was for you. And in some writings you speak of the potential of participation at the municipal level. Uh, could you elaborate on this? Do you share the idea that di direct democracy is the best strategy for the shaping of a social fabric favorable to communism? Well, I think there's nothing like direct democracy for getting large numbers of people involved and interested in politics. Uh, the instance of the um, the water privatization plebiscite was that I and people who are now in the Solidarity Party had been very heavily involved in the movement against the poll tax. And after we defeated that, the next issue that arose was the pro proposal by the Conservatives to sell off the water supply in Scotland to private people. We decided we would oppose that, and we started opposing it by um, direct action. We would occupy the meetings of the water board and uh, disrupt their activities. But we also put forward the demand to the local council that they carry out a vote on whether people were willing to do it, wanted this. And the council were, was a Labour council and didn't like the Tories, so it was willing to go along with that. And they held a vote and 90 something percent of people said they were against privatization. Now, it actually may, if you have a vote like that, it's actually politically impossible for the government to proceed with a, a privatization that has such overwhelming opposition, especially because we had proven that we would take direct action if, our, if the popular wishes weren't respected. They knew that if they privatized it in the face of that, we, people in Scotland would just not pay their water bills because we'd proven that we could do that by mobilizing at least a quarter of the population to not pay their taxes. So you have to back it up with the 
determination to carry out action to enforce a vote. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember you, you when we met I think in Glasgow, uh, uh, you talked about the, the poll tax, the campaign against the poll tax and how you posted and how you even talked to me and you showed me a place where they, um, the authorities had uh, seized property from someone who had refused to, to pay the poll tax and the authorities were going to auction that. And then you guys went in and disrupted the whole auction to try to, to, to prevent it from happening in solidarity with the person who had refused yeah. the, pay the poll tax. So uh, it, I think it's great that you mentioned that because it shows that um, that is certainly a way to get people involved with, with political issues to show how, they, how it affects their day-to-day -day lives and, I think it's 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 very interesting, uh, and uh, kind of yeah related to that, uh, one of the comrades was asking, um, uh, do you think the communist? I'm not I'm not sure if you're familiar with the with the with with Kerala in India, but uh, this comrade wanted to ask you if you think the communist experience in Kerala can teach us anything in that regard in the uh, related to the to the yeah, to, to direct democracy and politicization of the working class. I mean, I don't know enough about Kerala to really say. All I know is that it, the, the communists have done well to win elections there and to, they've done very well in fighting COVID and things like that. But I don't know enough of the details of how it's done. To, to, to... Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think our last question will be that uh, in your video socialist strategy in the face of taxation and tax evasion, you propose the incorporation of British overseas territories like the Cayman Islands to the common tax legislation of the UK in order to put an end to their function as a tax haven. Um, what kind of a country like Spain, which doesn't have such territorial influence due to fight what could Spain do to fight against the practice of tax evasion? So actually, it's been sort of a of a minor, I guess, debate in the last few weeks uh, in Spain, and I guess especially with younger people, because uh, if you're familiar with the with the with people who who earn a living through streaming video games and stuff like that, some of them have apparently have been doing quite well uh, financially. And some of the most famous ones in Spain recently announced that they were moving to Andorra, which is a tax <laughs> and, and people yeah, on Twitter yeah. and everywhere on social media were, you know, you had people who were like against that, people who were supporting that, mainly, you know, liberals saying, no, oh, it's their money, they can do whatever they want, blah, blah, blah. So how do you feel about that yeah. and what does <laughs> Spain do? Well, for, for the... EU, I mean, uh, Andorra, Liechtenstein, and, and Luxembourg have played a similar role as the yeah. Channel Islands and the Isle of Man and the British Virgin Islands. Uh, it, be, <laughs> there are obvious things that a country can do. Um, it could, for example, prohibit the ownership of firms by people or firms that were not resident in the in Spain so that you could say okay non-residents or non-resident firms could at most hold 20% of a, a Spanish firm or something so if effectively you could limit the amount that that could get out that way I don't know you'd have to go and look at the specific dodges that are used by tax lawyers in Spain to avoid it. Do, yeah. they, do, do they use the trick of saying, oh, um, we're not getting any income, we're just receiving loans from Andorra, which we'll pay back in 50 years time. Uh, do, is that how they hide their income? I think, I think what they do, I'm not really familiar with the issue, but what I think they do is what, actually it's nothing new at all, like some, uh, like some you know, elite sports people were doing back in the day is to move, actually move to Andorra, or so they say. So um, 
in tax legislation, if I'm not wrong, in Spain, if you reside for uh, more half a year or more, I, more than half a year actually, in that country, you are supposed to be paying uh, taxes there. So I'm guessing that you know they they actually say that they live there because they're they're living. It's just you know their their job is to stream through the internet, so they can do that from Andorra. And you know they say that because they're living there, they they want and they have to pay taxes there. And taxes there are lower, so. No. Uh, uh, no, you, you know, you, I was just. I can't tell you what what a good propo proposal would be without knowing enough more about Spanish tax law and the. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> specific holds that they have. No, yeah. I just wanted to, to let you know about the, <laughs> the debate no, but because the point is that's the kind of concrete analysis you should be doing. You should be looking right. at uh, mm -hmm. how is it that people are avoiding it in Spain and coming up with your own solutions to it. <laughs> right. Okay, so I think we cover most of the questions that the uh, people from SIPCOM came up with. Uh, we're um, really grateful for you to, to have agreed to do the interview with us. You've been a major influence in, in our project and we've got, well, you know, because I've been pestering you with yeah. messages asking you uh, about articles and whatnot. Um, we hope you keep doing. You well, keep. Uh, can can your you work. keep me informed about what you're you're publishing and what you're doing as well? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll send to you the the links and and everything of our recent translations and and articles that we've published. And uh, uh, it is a website, and yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll send you the website, the link to the website. Um. I think that's pretty much everything. We just wanted to thank you for agreeing to the interview and for your time and hope we can keep in touch and maybe uh, have another interview in the future and ask you about uh, the political and economic developments uh, okay, yeah. in the near future. Oh, uh, thank you very it's much. Nice to talk to you. Paul, I'm going to, I'm going to close the, to okay. say goodbye to our viewers in Spanish. Okay, so, eh, bueno, muchas gracias a a todos los que nos habéis visto, eh, no os olvidéis de seguirnos en las redes sociales, en nuestro Twitter, Tipcom.org, en Facebook, eh, seguir a Paul también en su canal de YouTube, a Jesús Rojo, y nada, esperamos, esperemos que os haya gustado la entrevista y la hayáis encontrado interesante.